Good afternoon and welcome to the final discussion session for the Centennial Celebration. This is Amelia Boynton Robinson. We have a wonderful panel here and we'll be discussing the right to vote of the meeting of the mayors. My name is Cheryl Wheeler Stewart. I just describe myself as an Alabama journalist. I work full time as an editor at the Birmingham News. Also, um, as a national writer for TheRoot.com and BlackAmericaWeb.com. Today on TheRoot.com, you will find a piece that I wrote, um, an interview. I did a four questions interview with uh, Mrs. Amelia Boynton Robinson. And you can find it today on TheRoot.com. So, without any further discussion from talking from me, I will allow the members of the panel to introduce themselves. Let's start, let's see, from my right. Yeah, Andrew Young, used to be mayor of Atlanta, a little bit of everything else. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Rose Sanders, and I inspired to write. I'm not a mayor, I don't know why I'm here, but I'm glad to be here. Karen Freeman Wilson, the Democratic mayoral nominee for the city of Gary, Indiana. Mm. James Perkins, junior former mayor of the city of Selma, served in the years 2000 to 2008. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to, I'm going to ask a few questions of the panel, and then at some point we will throw it open to the audience as well. What I'd first like to do is ask each member of the panel to tell us, to talk to us briefly about the role of voting rights or the role of motivating people to vote in in local elections. So let's talk about motivating people to vote in local elections and how that has impacted you. Well, let me say that uh, I grew up in New Orleans and one of the first lessons I learned before I was old enough to vote was there was a vacant lot there near my house and we had no place to play ball. My daddy said, there's an election coming up. If you call City Hall, I bet you they would come down and clean out that lot of New York to play baseball. So I think, you know, by 10 or 12 years old, I understood the relationship between the, my life and the political order. Now, maybe this was talked about before, but let me just tell the story uh, to get it out of the way, because I'm not going to be content till I do. Uh, Martin Luther King won the Nobel Prize in 1964. When we came back, Lyndon Johnson was even reluctant to meet with us. And he sent us to the Justice Department, and he waited until it was after dark and all the press had gone home. And then he said, Martin Luther King sent for us, and about 7.30 at night, we went to the White House and the President talked for over an hour. He didn't give us a chance to talk. He congratulated Dr. King on his Nobel Prize speech, but he began to, to uh, apologize for not being able to vote, to start a voting rights bill. And he said, in over an hour, he said, the President doesn't have as much power as you think he has. I wish I could do it, I just don't have the power. We walked out of the White House and we were walking down that dark road, no press there, no lights, and Martin Luther King said rather whimsically, well, I reckon we've got to figure out a way to get the president some power. And we all laughed, except that it was only about three or four days later when Mrs. Boynton and Reverend Reese and one other Baptist preacher, I can't remember his name, uh, Anderson, uh, Rev. Anderson came over and they asked us to come to Selma and told us how bad things were in Selma. So on about the 15th of December we made a commitment to come to Selma on the 2nd of January. Well, we, we didn't have a plan, we didn't know what we were going to do, we, we just 
figured that was the thing to do. Well, you all know some of what happened at Selma, but by the end of March, the 20th of March, in just three months, Lyndon Johnson had made his We Shall Overcome speech and had introduced the Voting Rights Bill. So it was Amelia Boynton and two preachers and a bunch of crazy young people led by Martin Luther King that gave the president some power. And I would say that uh, the unfortunate thing is that we don't feel free to picket and protest and raise hell with this president, but we have to kind of figure out a way in the next term to give him some power. I would like to say great minds work together, but I was going to say the same thing about giving this president some power. I wanted to bring it current uh, because there was another great president, another great African American who went to the president and said, Mr. President, these are some things you should do. And he said, yes, make me do it. And I think uh, that's where we are with the power of the vote, that we are not using our power to make things happen locally and nationally. I have not, nor have I ever wanted to be a mayor, but I've worked in very early elections. And it's hard and hard to get people to vote. People are not motivated to vote. And we have to ask the question, why? And I don't condemn the voters. Uh, people are not motivated to vote because they don't see their interests being addressed. And I think as activists and people in the community, we have to be the catalyst. We have to be the people to educate and to inspire, especially our young people. What we did to myself, I was not a part of this. Oh, one of my greatest regrets is that I was not a part, an intricate part of that history. And I think that's why when we came to Selma, a group of us alone this morning to say, well, we need to make sure that this history is there for others to see, to smell, to hear, and be inspired by. So every year we reenact the Selma Montgomery March. I see one of our board members of the National Voting Rights Museum in the audience. We started this museum. We started the Jubilee so that we could motivate people to vote. And What's happening on the scene right now that's very frightening, and I'll ask this another question. All the gains that took place because of your heroic efforts are now being taken back. My husband's in the Alabama State Senate. He is now quote unquote powerless because uh, after the last election, Republicans took over everything. The wrong wing took over everything. The first thing they did was to take away the right to vote, voter ID. Uh, uh, birth certificates, all these things are being done as we sit silently by and let it happen. So the question is, what can we do to motivate and inspire people, both young and old, to grab the power so that we will not go back? When I think about the importance of exercising the right to vote, um, as a kid, uh, 44 years ago, I um, got a chance to stay up late waiting for the election returns uh, when Richard Hatcher was elected the mayor of Gary. And even though I was seven, I remember the grassroots effort that was employed to take him into office and to have him in office for 20 years, five terms as mayor. And then, which is much different from now, people felt that they had a vested interest in participating. And Sister Rose is actually absolutely right. People don't see what the interest is. They don't see the ballpark or the impact of, on the ballpark that Ambassador Young talks about. And so what we have to do now is really get people to understand the vested interests that they have. And, and you can't just tell them, well, it impacts your housing or it impacts your ability to get jobs. You really have to take the time to break it down. 
What has happened is that politics has really become an art, almost a sport in a lot of communities. And so you will hear an incumbent say, well, it's to my benefit to keep the voting numbers down because that favors incumbency. Or you will hear someone else to say, well, I'm not going to go to that community and campaign because I don't think that they're going to support me. Or I'm not going to try and register voters because I don't know what the new voters will do. I don't know if they will support me or not. But the reality is, is that we have to increase the involvement not just of our young people, but of all people, because the voter turnout in our communities across this country is abysmal. And it's largely because people don't see uh, elected officials serving their interests, but it sort of becomes what comes first, the chicken or the egg. Because if you don't see them serving your interests and you don't participate, then they will continue to serve their own interests. And so that's the, the quandary that we really have to resolve. In 1865, signing the Emancipation Proclamation, whites in this country rarely voted. In fact, when African Americans began to register and vote, once receiving the right to vote, African Americans were being elected to Congress in record numbers, both in the House and the Senate. That was primarily because whites in the South were not voting. <coughs> well, they figured out uh, the power of the vote by African Americans' participation in the process. Um, the consequence, Jim Crow law, rolling back the time and tide through fear and intimidation. And then people like Sam and Amelia Boynton, the Courageous Eight, I was thankful to hear Ambassador Young mention F.D. Reese, who was the chairman of the Dallas County Voters League in 1965. If my history serves me correctly, it was going to wrote the letter and Dr. Reese signed the letter to invite SCLC and Dr. King to sell that uh, a significant event. But then again, we begin to participate in the voting process uh, through legislative acts, the signing of the Voting Rights Act, which provided protection uh, for people of color to vote. And there was a direct correlation established between voting and the quality of life. People in Selma at that time, uh, a gentleman who uh, comes to mind immediately, Samson Crum. I, I don't know what Samson's level of education was, but I don't believe that it was very high. But Samson Crum understood clearly the power of the vote and the significance of public officials in the lives of people because he would go as a representative of the Black Leadership Council from Selma, Dallas County, Montgomery, identify the voting record of legislators, and then come back and teach the people in the community through the Black Leadership Council, the voting records of people who were representing us in Montgomery. And from there, we would then make decisions as to who uh, we should vote for. We have come to a place now in the voting process where African Americans have been told encouraged and persuaded that we don't need to block vote, there is no need to blow, vote to coalition vote, and that we really, in many instances, don't need to vote because it's not going to make any difference. We are going to have to re-establish the connectivity between the quality of life and the legislative process in this country. The realities are there's nothing that we do say or anything about our lives that are not impacted by people who are elected from where we're born to the conditions upon which we're buried. Um, the, the ingredients that's used to, uh, for grooming in our hair to the toothpaste that we use, everything at some point is impacted and affected by a public official. And that includes whether the lot next to your house get cut or whether your garbage get picked up on time. 
it's all impacted by elected officials. We simply have to connect the dots and make sure that people really begin to understand how public officials, elected officials, Im impact our lives in very real ways. Can I say something on the balance? Because we, we have so many leaders now that we almost cancel each other out. And um, if Martin Luther King had been alive when the banks were bailed out, he would have been able to say, why give $700 billion to the banks? Why not give every homeowner a year's grace on their mortgage and put the money into the homeowners? The bank still would have gotten bailed out, but the money didn't come to the people on the bottom. It went to the people on the top, and so the people on the bottom are still catching hell. And the people on the top are not doing much better. I mean, they, they, they get big bonuses, but their lives have not been appreciably improved because the world is more dangerous now well, than, than, than it would have been if it were truly a humanitarian democracy rather than an economic oligarchy. When you talk about improving the quality of life by exercising the right to vote, we come back to one thing that each of the panelists has touched on, and that is collaboration, networking, whether it's the Dallas County Voters League, the Black Leaders Council, or I know personally about the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights that was started by the Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth. When we think about those kinds of initiatives, those organizations that contributed so much to our rich history, what can we do at this point to reestablish or to reinvigorate our younger generation with that same kind of momentum that gave rise to the Dallas County Voting League and the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights and similar organizations that brought us together and propelled us to uh, power. Dr. Bernard Lafayette mentioned this morning that one of Dr. King's philosophies was to, to deal with the challenges of the victim before dealing with the victimizing. In other words, to touch the lives of the oppressed before you challenge the oppressor. You know, there are, one of the things, and, and I, 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 I made a decision to speak to this uh, just recently, there, but there's one thing that I think we really need to look at at the local level, and that is in municipal government, there are departments to address virtually every aspect of municipal life, uh, from picking up garbage to water quality to paving streets to making sure traffic lights work, uh, public safety, the list goes on and on. If you ask a public official, any elected official at the municipal level, what is the most valuable asset you have in your community, the consistent answer will be your people. Yet there is very rarely, if ever, a department within municipal government that specifically addresses the needs of the people in the community. When we begin to do that, and we did that in Selma, develop a community outreach department, begin to do some things directly to regain trust and to educate the people, that became one of the most threatening, one of the most threatening ideas to the people who choose to not elevate people from the bottom. There is a very cash benefit to having poor folk. There is a real benefit to having people in your communities who cannot lift themselves. And so when you begin to elevate people, to really educate people, and to change the station of people's lives, that's when municipal officials are near elected. I'm, I'm, I'm proud of you, you Mayor uh, of Gary. You, that's when you will begin to realize and see the 
greatest challenges that you will have in, in municipal office? Prophet Mayor, uh, I, I certainly appreciate that word of prophecy. Uh, but I, I uh, could not agree with you more. Um, during the course of the primary campaign that I was involved in, one of the things that struck me the most uh, was an opportunity to sit in small settings with young people and to hear from them what their concerns were, what their needs were, the things that mattered to them. They talked about jobs, they talked about public safety, and they talked about the fact that there was nothing to do. And they talked about what their solution to those issues were, and generally it was just to leave town. But the significance of that was that in those smaller settings, in just the pockets of, and, and we call them house parties, uh, in those small house parties, we were able to talk to them, but also to motivate them to organize and to begin to talk to them about ways that they could change the issues that they were concerned about. They talk about their cars and their potholes because they drive too and they have to get by tires and by axles and do all of those things. And so they said, well, I think we'll do a letter writing campaign or I think we'll go down to City Hall to the City Council meeting or I think that, and if you begin to empower them and, and un help them to understand that yes, your vote does count. Yes, you can make a difference. Yes, if you organize and if you go in numbers, the elected officials will pay attention. They will listen to you. And But we have to start, I think, at the grassroots level to get that done. But right, right now, we're on the wrong agenda because Everything you say would have been true 10 years ago. And I'm not blaming you, but right now, the money controls the elections. And the, the law that the Supreme Court passed that said that corporations can give as much money as they want, uh, just like individuals, has change the game for us. Now, it, it doesn't mean that, it, I'm not saying that everything you say is not true, but the, we can't put the burden on our kids to do that. That we have to find a way to help people understand that what we're hearing on television now, you hear it every day, that we have to take our country back. Uh, Obama has uh, raised taxes. He's He's made the hurricanes, he's brought in the, the earthquakes, and everything is wrong because of Obama. Now, those ads are on, I mean, there, there has been a half a billion dollars worth of advertising against Obama, and the campaign hadn't started yet. And so, we really are fighting for our lives, and we have to have we have to let people know that we are on the way back to slavery. Well, hear him. See? And, and uh, it's, it's not, I mean, you, you, you won't have health insurance. They want to take away that. They want to raise the age on some Social Security. That won't hurt me because uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in. But, and they won't mess with senior <laughs> citizens as much as they'll mess with Head Start. When they say they want to uh, cut back the budget, they don't want to cut back and not pay taxes. They are operating in an economic realm that even I am just now trying to understand. I understood politics. I understood preaching and I understood people. But I don't know macroeconomics, and the president doesn't either, and Jimmy Carter didn't, and in fact, I, I think the people who are running this country are not particularly the elected officials, and, and we, we have got to wake up 
and realize that I tell kids now, I know you're a lawyer and a good one, but whenever somebody comes and says, would you write a recommendation to law school for me? I said, no. I said, we got a lot of lawyers and all they're doing is presiding over divorces uh, and, uh, and malpractice suits and things like that. Most of the problems they're facing are a result of people not having enough money. And so I've been encouraging people, instead of going to law school, you might get richer, but if you go and get a PhD in economics and finance, you will probably be doing now what Thurgood Marshall and them did in the 30s and 40s. See? They laid a foundation for 20 years in legal work before we started marching. Then when we started marching, we had both a, a legal and a political base. That political base has been virtually neutralized by the last election. And we don't have a legal base. It just dawned on me that we probably could not march from Selma to Montgomery under the present judges in the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. <laughs> they, would not, they would not give us the permit that Judge Johnson did in 1965. So we are really in bad shape. You, I don't know why you want to run for mayor. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, because, it, well, it's a frustrating situation because they'll put you in and do you just like they did Obama. They put him in and black people alone did not put him in. So they put him in to put the blame on him. And you will get elected to take the blame. And I, I was very fortunate in Atlanta that I got elected mayor and they picketed me at two o'clock in the afternoon the same day I was, I, I was elected. And that was my boys from SELC. And, but it let me know that they were not gonna cut me any slack. And I better figure out a way, and, and, and the Lord blessed us. We didn't know what we were gonna do in Selma. But, it, it, you know, the Lord will make a way out of no way. And so, politics won't help you. You've got to have Jesus. <laughs> And, and the Holy Spirit, and, and, and all kinds of miracles, uh, because we're, we're in really troubled times. Not old folks would say that uh, all of these hurricanes and all of these earthquakes and all of this stuff that's happening now, uh, Mother Nature's mad about something. And we, we have to kind of, we have to kind of get really serious about where we are in the world today. Well, I, I just want to take it up in a, a slightly different direction. Uh, those of you who are here this morning, I really don't believe any of these problems can be solved with politics. I think politics is, um, is a way towards the solution but not until you have a people who are conscious of the problem. I was very uh, struck by the last presentation when Dwight, the first astronaut, talked about he didn't know he was black. And he told me privately that he was the first astronaut that's destined to go to space, but when President Kennedy was killed, the federal government said, oh no, we don't need you anymore, which is good. I was also well, good because he became one of our great sculptures. Yes. <laughs> I'm struck by the fact that we have never had a civil rights movement or human rights movement to demand high quality, truth best based education for our children. That's why Dwight was lost. That's why men of our children were lost. Um, my friend Katrina confessed in your presence. We stayed up to four o'clock in the morning at Tuskegee because her son said, I would never be, take, take a black girl. This is a young black man. Mm. Our problems are great and they're linked together. You may not see the relationship between her son and the, one of the best school systems, the Hoover system, said I will not date a black girl. And the black man in prison 
who only dates black girls, but he steals and burglarizes for black homes. There's a direct relationship between a man who is on the Supreme Court, who ruled that he could give uh, people as much money these corporations, but in Alabama, by the way, this is a side note, they just passed a law that AEA, Alabama New South, you can't get no get out the vote money. So the corporations can give as much as they want, but community-based organizations can't receive money to get out the vote. All of this stuff is connected, and the one connected source is the miseducation of the Negro. I can't, the miseducation of the Negro. I don't know why we love to quote Carter G. Woodson, but we would not implement what he told us to do 80 years ago. And until we deal with the source of the cancer, so because what we do, uh, we will not make the right political decisions or the right economic decisions until we understand what is in our best interest. And we don't know what's in our best interest because we are taught from grade, kindergarten on up, what's in the best interest of the people in power. And their interest is to keep their power at our expense. And until we recognize that, we will become participants in our own oppression. That's why in Selma, Alabama, in the last election, a young black man ran for the district judge. We've never had a black district judge. But 68% of the black folk in a city that's 8% black voted for that white man who sends his children to segregated private schools and goes to the segregated country club where President Obama could not come in. And this is the city with the majority black government that would not name a street after the Boyntons. This is what we're dealing with. And until we end the miseducation of our people, and it won't happen overnight, but there's not even a plan to do it. There's not even a will. There's not even an understanding that we need to do it. That's why a young man could be killed in Mississippi and not make the national news but once. James Anderson, when rich white kids from upper middle class community say, let's kill us a nigga, and the first person they saw was James Anderson. They beat him up, and when he doesn't die, they take their truck and run over him. It's caught on camera. And a black district judge was so mad, and he's going to prosecute, he arrested only two. It was a whole group of them, including girls. A girl was in the car when they ran over him and killed him. Oh, but the black district judge is only going to arrest two for conspiracy, but in Alabama, Democrats, black and white, were taken from their homes in handcuffs with chains around their feet at 6 o'clock in the morning and, and charged with conspiracy to commit these crimes. And thank God the jury found them not guilty last week. My point is that we keep making these bad decisions. And like the last uh, speaker said, when he went to South Carolina, and, 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 and wanted to build a monument. It was black legislators said, don't put Denmark Vesey there, because they knew that Denmark Vesey <laughs> was a rebel. He rebelled against state-supported terrorism. Does it bother anybody that we would go to Libya to protect the rights of people when they are being attacked by their government, when people were attacked by their government right here, day after day, year after year, and the government never intervened to stop. Does that not bother? Do we not know the parallel? We don't know the parallel because we don't know the history. And until we teach the history and we understand the history, everything